I'm John Miglosh for the Wisconsin DMA and the International Society for Strategic Marketing. We're going to go really fast today, so buckle up. As I said yesterday, there's anomalies and anomalies uh, uh, about hand washing. That's what I talked about yesterday. And we've got anomalies today about some novel treatments that don't exactly fit up with how we think viruses are supposed to be treated but seem to be effective. We'll figure that out later. But it's anomalies. It's the, it's, the, it's the things that don't quite fit our model that help us advance in science. And the same thing is true in marketing, as I said yesterday. So let's dig in and let's see what we can learn from science and the process of marketing. What we're after is growth and profit. And there's not very many ways to get that. What the CEO wants is return on investment, stable, profitable growth, and strategic insights. Marketing is basically predicting the future. Now we have to, we have to see into the future and see what our customers are going to be most interested in and how we can portray that in a way that will cut the clutter and get to the customer. The tricky part is, is that tomorrow is like yesterday. Modeling is all based on historical data, even when they talk about real-time data it's all historical it's all in the past and the past will be like yesterday yesterday will be like tomorrow except if it isn't so you heard of the scientific chicken she noticed that whenever the farmer called she got fed over and over and over and over and over and over so she got to the front of the line and was very successful at getting the most and best feed it worked until the last day you have to be very careful how you extend the past into the future because Scott Adams says it doesn't exactly re replicate. It kind of does and it kind of doesn't. We talked about the bathtub model. Let's imagine that you've got your customers in a bathtub and we shake it to make sure the heads are level. Okay, and they have a certain value. They have a certain value year after year after year. You can open the spigot and add more in and there's some going down the drain. Okay, and that gives you an excellent picture of the growth of your company and you can measure the profit per time frame and get an idea of the value of what's in the bathtub. You can also get a value, get an idea. You can pretty much tell matching customers coming in to the to the entire puddle here how which ones are new. <clears throat> but for every one you add in, the level doesn't go up correspondingly, and that's because some are not coming back. And you can look at those counts and establish a flow model, which is easier than trying to decide who is still active and who isn't. You can do some of that by sending your file out and matching it. But the truth is, as I said many times, for 10 years I took a hiatus from Land's End. I started buying from Land's End probably in about, about 73, 74 in there. And uh, around uh, 2000 to 2010, I didn't buy anymore. And then I started up again for funny reasons. And my password was still good, and there I was. Land's End, on any basis, would have thought I went down the drain. But no, I was still circulating in there. I just didn't tell them. Didn't tell them I would come back. I have a turtleneck and a fleece from Land's End today. Okay? So, what we need to do is we need to figure out who in there are more promotable, more likely to buy, and... Uh, we need to figure out, so that will drive customer value. As customer value goes up, we get more acquisition le leverage. As the value per head in there is increased, then the amount available for acquisition also increases. <clears throat> so you either sell more to existing customers or find more valuable customers. That's the only way, <clears throat> excuse me, the only way it works. Now, the tricky part is, what do you do with the one one ones there are people on an RFM basis that haven't bought lately, only bought once, and didn't spend much. Okay? That is the puzzle. Most of the people in that bathtub are not that great. This is kind of what it looks like in RFM, in, our, in recency, or we can do frequency. There's some that have bought a lot of times, there's some that have bought a little less, and there's some that only bought once. And if you had to pick, especially if they've gotten a little old, you just lop them off. You just kill everyone there. But then you wake up in the middle of the night and you think, hey, wait a minute. 
Some of those one-time buyers are brand new. They got a pretty high likelihood of coming back. Thanks for the heart. They got a pretty high likelihood of coming back. So then we add another variable. Let's say we add the money score. Let's say, oh, there's people that have only bought once, but, well, the white ones are the ones we want to mail. They only bought once, but they spent a lot of money. A five is a great monetary score. It's a little easier to work with than recency, okay? And so we, instead of a, a really monolithic slice, and I have run companies just on recency, and, um, you know, then you get just recency and frequency. But as we get more variables, we get more sophistication. We get a better, we get a better picture. So up here, we're saying, well, we're going to mail the people that didn't spend much, but bought a lot of times, and we're going to spend, and those you have to be really careful with, but let's just say. And down here, we're going to, we're going to mail or contact or call or send the field sales out. It works on all kinds of media. We're going to say, oh, these people um, only bought once, but they're worth a lot, a lot of money. Makes sense? Okay. And if we can get enough variables, we can find all kinds of pockets in the one-time buyers that didn't spend much, but they bought something that gives us a clue. Or get rid of the five time, the, the high-value customers that are in a high likelihood of returning what they buy, which also can be found. So we find the 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 bad and the good and the good and the bad and how do we do that what we do is we add more variables that's part of the game okay because we're looking for these anomalies we're looking for the treatment that works even if it doesn't make any sense and to see that you need to have lots of data that's important but the data is not self-revealing so as an example when you're doing an archery offer as we did with cabela's we would look and say well there's people across all of these rfm cells but only a few of them bought archery so that's another level of another variable you just have to create variables i thought that what i wanted was the raw data but the raw data is little rows of numbers and it's not illuminating variables are our lens of observation for our customers so spinning straw, straw into gold takes a little magic. Why? Because the more variables you get, the harder it is to analyze. Here's another example. We add hunting, fishing, camping, etc. for each different offer. That's the kind of that's sort of the way we got started moving from RFM into more variables. But you have to get a little more creative. We also added about we normally out of the box add about 250 geodemographic variables and they are crazy variables the number of pets per capita um, the we did one for the saltwater proximity we did one for the fish <laughs> the fishing stores for Cabela's we've done a lot of crazy stuff baseball by type of baseball per capita Okay, so, we, you know, normally they start with things like income, home value, education, population, etc. We use the census long form, which includes things like uh, the percentage of mobile homes, the percentage of propane heat, <laughs> all kinds of things. We create a lot of crazy variables. In fact, we've even created the werewolf variable. <clears throat> the werewolf variable is the, is the people who like to shop on the full moon. It's hard to build because the full moon moves around by month. Um, we built it for musician's friend, goaded on by Travis Seaton <laughs> and my friend Travis Seaton. And uh, what we found was that half the there were only there were only the sales were the same about the same. Sorry, but there were about half as many customers who bought on the full moon, which meant they were worth double the sales. Now, we didn't do a lot with it because of some other extraneous circumstance. But here's a graph that is 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 really important. This one we might focus on for a little bit. Okay, this graph says that in RFM we use basically three or four variables. Now the modelers, you hire a modeler, and they might use something called linear or nonlinear or multiple regression. And what they try to do is remove the uh, collinear variables, move the ones that are redundant and get it down to the really important variables. Now, the danger in that is, is that I can tell you that the percentage of mobile homes, the percentage of propane heat, the percentage of, of solar heat, the percentage of people who graduate from high school are all connected, and income, and population. 
They tend to be sort of deep southy variables. So you could eliminate them all because why not? We'll just use the graduation rate or we'll just use the uh, per capita income. But it masks things. It masks the anomalies. Okay. Now you can also go up to AI and neural net. The tricky part is there it uses so many variables and each customer may be se selected on an individual basis on an amazing neural net matrix but you really don't know what it's doing. And I have gone over this with modelers in that field. The, the AI neural net, um, it, it, it's very difficult. You can get some feel for it. But what we do instead is we, we use chi-squared automatic interaction detector and it builds a little tree because spinning straw into gold takes a little bit of magic and so we get something like this and normally I move recency to the top because it's the most easy to understand you may not be able to read these things but what it does is it shows me oh there's a different variable with the really new buyers that's the next most important versus maybe the old buyers and there's a way to break down all of what's going on okay so what I did with with Dick Cabela was I went through each little split. We get these little splits and I said, Dick, do you think that uh, fishermen are more blue collar or more upscale, white collar? He said, I think more blue collar. I said, yep, this is what that shows. And I was able to show him that. And so even though we throw 500 variables at the wall, it's totally transparent. Dick Cabela with no statistical background can understand it. With Pet Edge, we had declining sales and uh, we ended up doing a split test. We got 84% more profit um, in the fall. But then when we went around to the spring, we got a very, very downscale model. And it was just didn't make any sense. And so with some investigation, what we found out was that in the spring, most dog owners, as the weather warms up, get their dogs clipped. Not the grooming, not the little fifi with the costume on in the in the so this is a Halloween costume, the witch costume. <laughs> not that kind of dog grooming. Because we could model, because we could build variables, we actually figured out which items in their group of SKUs were for the very, very professional costume type groomers. And then we kept them basically getting the same kind of upscale make the dog into a cartoon character or a, into a, a fashion model you know a hundred dollars per visit to the dog groomer versus the dog clippers who are you're taking it to the vet or the dog kennel and just you know getting the hair cut off for the for the for the warmer weather it turned out that that market was was way more may, we don't know 20 times more and so by by understanding that anomaly huge anomaly especially for b2b we were able to drive 20 percent plus growth in the wake of 9 11 for three years and we we basically changed the profile pet edge was a new name before that it was called something else and this is glenn Holt talking about it bullock and jones we did unique tests we pulled, in this particular case, their uniques pulled $1.50, ours pulled $15, and um, that's like a 1,000% win. And Eric Goodwill, who's listed here, would take me to dinner because he also said that we found 20% more mailable names compared to their RFMP setup that they were using and so we were able to see that the, the the formal wear market was declining we were able to drive people to find out who more casual wear would would appeal to golf specifically and footwear and help them grow dramatically and then get acquired by Saks Fifth Avenue Highlander we were able to help them with an acquisition of Xena Hercules we were also able to help them develop a jewelry catalog. Oh, this is a jewelry catalog. This is a sale catalog. You know, your sale buyers can be very different than your, than your full price buyers. That's what anomalies can tell you. That's what variables can tell you. But the more variables you have, the more interesting an analysis system you need.
and then you have to be able to pull it reliably. I'm always amazed at companies who think they're going to just build this themselves. Baseball Express acquired Softball Express. We helped drive that. They also created Fast Pitch for the, for the girls. Now, interesting thing that happened in baseball is I, I said to him one day, I called him up and I said, hey, you know, you're selling this, you're selling pitching equipment. What, what kind of customers buy a four or five thousand uh, dollar, you know, automatic pitcher? And they said, oh, well, leagues and stuff. I said, did you ever think about do, doing ba business to business marketing? They said, no, we're strictly consumer. I said, well, you know, aren't leagues, and they said major league teams and colleges, those are businesses. We should be marketing separately to them. We should up the ante. We found the same thing in Cabela's. We found some se segments that were over 100% response rate. Now, it's a tiny little fraction of their customer file, you know, one one thousandth or something. But part of the way we create variables is we create them a lot of different perspectives and so we were able to see this the really hot ones way up in the upper left corner that I showed you and they created an entire business to business actually a, a big industry I helped Land's End with that also where we found that people were doing imprinted merchandise now it's worth I don't know what they said uh, the American uh, the American Airlines partnership was worth tens of millions of dollars and I helped get that going because we saw that people wanted to do that, wanted to put their own logo on it. Uh, musician's Friend, we were able to do <clears throat> acoustic guitar sections, drum supplements, um, because we could actually find out with enough variables, and you know, especially things like uh, percentage of mobile homes. <laughs> we found that was a really power. That was one of the most powerful geodemographic variables. I had a side, side, <laughs> a side bet with. Uh, was it Craig Johnson, the president? He said, oh, the demographics don't work. I showed him they work over and over and over. Not most of them don't work. 80, 90% don't work. But there's always one or two. Anomalies. <clears throat> Adobe, we found out that the artists were, the artists congregated in certain, like even buildings within a city. And we were able to change the way they marketed to the best buildings. And we went from 25 million in sales for this is the Image Club Graphics division to an annualized 50 million in sales in about six months. Oh, brother. Okay, so spinning stole, spinning stole into God. Spinning strata gold takes magic. Love sack, you've heard over and over. But what we were able to do, I mean, we spotted pet owners in our database because we had forgotten to take the variables out for pet edge you know from long ago uh, and we found out that pet owners were a good market and that that led to other discoveries about why people bought their particular product that you could unzip it throw it in the wash machine and keep it basically forever new and that became something like that became a tagline that we were able to see in head-to-head -head tests okay what we're all about spotting the anomalies and we're all about testing against what you do. That's what the CEO wants, repeatable performance. So Musician's Friend actually tests us 11 times uh, in head-to-head -head tests against six different modeling companies over six years, always 500,000 or more pieces. <clears throat> we just did some tests this fall. Um, it wasn't a thousand percent, but it was, it was way more than our target. And we spotted some things. I have to say we will skip that <clears throat> so we've got a great track record what we do is we set it up to be testing right off the bat okay we guarantee that we're going to build it and get it in the mail in 90 days 20 percent win or we walk away <clears throat> or better um, and we have a proven 25 year methodology for implementing machine learning where we can see what's going on. We have five levels of data analysis in the process every time. So anomalies matter. Anomalies can drive millions and millions of dollars. Would you be interested in 20% growth right now? 
Would you like to prove which part of your marketing is most effective? Call. Run it by me. Let's see. Would you like to know what offer ignites your customers? That's why this works. It's because it looks for anomalies. It reveals anomalies. It's a different process than anybody else is using. I'm not saying there aren't some people using Chade, but basically the modelers fall into those two camps. AI, which you get lift, but you don't understand why. Regression, where you mask the variables or RFM. I'm John Miglosh. Have a great day. Like and share. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.